Um, I wanted to stay in London. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to kind of have that experience of going to another city. I wanted to, to stay connected to the mm -hmm. city that I felt very connected to. Mm -hmm. When I came to, I, re I read that basically Queen Mary had a very good English department. So mm -hmm. I wanted to be at a uni that had a high standard yeah. academically. And when I came to Queen Mary and looked around it, the, the campus, the fact that it had this huge campus was, yeah, banging, like, mm. I really liked that. <laughs> and and also I felt that the university, when I saw kind of the mix of people at the university, that it was very representative mm. of London. Mm -hmm. And I just felt it would be like a, a home away from home. A lot of people have talked about in terms of what's represented in the book, in terms of what, what they'd refer to as a double life. Mm. A lot of people have referred to that as a double life. To me, it wasn't a double life. Mm. It was just my life. Yeah. My life was this mixture of me being involved in a lot of street, street things, a lot mm. of gang culture and everything, mm. and going to university, which was just as much a, a part of my life as, as the other mm. things that I was involved in, basically. Mm. And also there was a certain aspect to it where it was important for my sense of identity that mm -hmm. I was doing university because it was something I was passionate about. I never yeah. hid it from people. Mm -hmm. And I was the same person in university that I was on the streets mm -hmm. in the sense of like, I, I wasn't being a chameleon who was mm -hmm. kind of adapting to different environments and putting on different masks for different situations. I was just being me. I made a lot of friends at university. Um, I made a couple of very important friends at mm -hmm. university with whom I'm very, very close to now. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, there is something very powerful about the way in which literature can connect people and a passion for a subject or a passion for what you're studying can connect people. And you don't necessarily have to inhabit the same worlds in terms of your personal life. You yeah. can bond just over your shared love of literature and mm -hmm. how you identify with literature in mm -hmm. your lives. I think people were aware yeah. of a certain aspect of my life because of how I was myself. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like I was sitting in seminars with like, you know, my <laughs> Averex jacket and diamond <laughs> grills in my mouth discussing Shakespeare. So I think, you know, people kind of were like, yeah, he's he's obviously <laughs> not living some atypical student life. Yeah. But on the other hand as well, yeah, and my, I mean, my lecturers definitely knew, like when I went to prison, my, my, I, got, I was deregistered actually when I went to mm -hmm. Felton because I couldn't let anybody know. Mm -hmm. And then my mum contacted my advisors and told them the situation and they were very understanding. And that's one thing as well, I mean, quite apart from the amazing educational experience I had at Queen Mary, the way in which I met certain professors who genuinely cared about people, mm -hmm. they genuinely cared about their students. Mm -hmm and the, the lives of their students beyond just handing in 3,000 word essays yeah. um, had a b big, big impact on me, yeah. you know, because their kindness and their empathy and understanding, you know, kind of helped me basically mm. to, to make sure that I got an English literature degree. Mm. You could be whoever you, you wanted to mm. be, like there was a total acceptance of, mm -hmm. of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I also liked that in terms of mixing with people that I wouldn't have mixed with like outside of university and coming into close contact with people from different backgrounds mm -hmm. and everything and feeling this kinship with people because we're all studying the same thing. So suddenly you're meeting these people that in normal life you might never have met, you might never have talked to. Mm -hmm. And because we're in a, in a seminar or whatever together and you know, there's this exposition of our passions that we're all passionate about English literature, that's mm -hmm. why we're here. Mm -hmm. It's like it created this, this kind of unspoken connection between yeah. everybody. Yeah. Coming here to the campus, there's there's a certain sadness that, that fills me because it brings back a lot of memories of that time. And, you know, living a criminal life is like a huge waste. It's a mm. huge waste of a life and it's a huge waste of time and it's a huge waste of valuable years that you could be using to do something constructive and productive in it. And there's a certain, it's tinged with a certain sadness for me because I remember how deeply, deeply embedded in a criminal lifestyle I was and mm. how destructive it was. Mm. And, you know, I remember I'd stay at somebody's house on campus or flat on campus and I'd stay the night, for example, and get woken up in the morning by my mum saying, you know, the police are looking for you. Mm. They came and buzzed our door at four in the morning and they went through your room searching for things. And, and 
while I was like, yeah, I'm, I'll hand myself in, but first I need to go and hit this lecture at 9 a.m. and then the seminar yeah. because I need to do them and then I'll go and hand myself in or whatever. So there was this huge juxtaposition mm. of, of my personal interests. When I finished uni, I was like, you know, I didn't detach myself from that lifestyle. I carried on within that lifestyle. And yet, because of the experience I'd had at uni, there was this strong, it was the beginning basically of this strong feeling in the back of my mind that I need to escape this life and I, it needs to stop at some point because it's not sustainable. And the passion that I had for literature and the passion that was that was basically stirred within me by the course and the degree and, and everything that I studied for three years at Queen Mary, um, it kind of awoke this feeling in me that that basically I need to do something genuinely constructive with my life and it needs to be centered around my passion for literature. When I was 13 years old, I knew I wanted to be a writer and I knew I wanted to write books. And I remember at the age of 13, starting to write this epic novel about the First World War, I guess, <laughs> set in the trenches of the Somme. And it's like, you know, it's interesting because it's like, yeah, when you're younger, like you don't know enough in a sense, I would say to, to write on certain subjects and write about certain things. But on the other hand, when you're experiencing literature and you're obsessed with books and reading them, it does teach you a lot about the world and it does teach you a lot about human experience without you having necessarily experienced them. In terms of the book itself, the book that I've written, like I was always saying to my friends when I was involved in that lifestyle that's represented in the book, I was like, one day I'm going to write a book about all of this. And one of the things that happened is when the book came out, I got all these messages from friends and they were like, you finally did it. Like, and they were all saying like, we remember how you kept saying one day I'm going to write a book about this. And yeah. so that was always there and also while I was living that lifestyle I used to obsessively record events as they happened because I was like I'm not going to remember this accurately mm. in the future or conversations which would be very surreal like I remember this conversation that I had with with a barrister in in court and he was saying basically how because I'd been to prison before he was like if you go to prison again it won't kill you and mm. he was like you should just get six lashes which I thought was mm. like really funny old school kind of <laughs> mentality yeah. and then he was like you're just gonna have to do your time and, and you know read some books when you're in prison mm. and I was like crime and punishment <laughs> and he was like laughing and he was like oh yeah and then I was like oh the trial by Kafka and we like had this mad banter basically mm. I remember it in Southwark Crown Court about literature mm. and literature related to crime and stuff and I was like right after that I got a um, one of the sheets of my probation report and wrote out the entire conversation word for word because I was like I won't remember this yeah, in the future yeah. and it's such a good and weird conversation yeah. that it's like I have to record it so I had that's depicted in your book yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that exact conversation <laughs> is, is in the book word for word mm. like how it happened basically so and funny. yeah and I had this obsession with writing things down so I was in a weird way I was already in the headspace of being a writer where I was writing things down writing down experiences um, but the actual commitment to being a writer came much later because there is this moment in terms of being a writer and of course it, it depends as well on how people can manage their time mm -hmm. in terms of work and you know you need financial stability mm -hmm. which is also a huge risk factor in being a writer so you mm -hmm. have to really it has to really be your passion mm -hmm. I wouldn't if somebody said to me how can I make money I wouldn't tell them be a writer yeah. like yeah. you know you have to do it because it's a it's a need or it's an urge mm -hmm. within you yeah but um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of that moment of commitment, I was like, I remember, I think I went through basically a year of feeling this, con having this constant feeling. And it used to always be, strangely enough, whenever I used to go to sleep just before drifting off to sleep, I'd have this feeling of you're wasting time. If this is what you want to do with your life, stop wasting time, mm. stop wasting time. And one day I was like, that's it, mm. I'm going to write. In Hemingway's book, A Movable Feast, when he's mm. writing about being a writer in Paris, there's this great bit when he's got kind of a writer's block and he's staring out across the, the Paris rooftops and then he thinks to himself just write the truest thing that you know mm. because as long as you can do that you'll always be able to write something and sometimes that's what you've got to do you've got to sit down and then rather than trying too hard to think about what you want to write in terms of a story or mm. what story you want to tell just write something that's true to yourself mm. and even if you don't keep that in your book or you don't include that in whatever you're trying to write it will trigger something within you like mm -hmm. in terms of your productivity and creativity. I think I'd sent out a couple of short stories to like literary magazines and hadn't had much success with them. Um, I think partly because of the 
the stuff I was writing about and the way in which I was writing about or the way in which I was writing in terms of using London slang which a lot of literary magazines are just going to be like this is not our thing mm. um, whether they like it or not um, so Vice I was like I think Vice is the right publication mm. for my short stories and for my type of writing and what I did is I basically found that rather than contacting an editor I found a phone number for Vice mm -hmm asked to be put, I called them up, asked to be put through to the editorial department. And because of how Vice is specifically, I was like, I'm not going to fin try and finesse this or anything. Mm. I'm just going to have a very blunt approach. Mm -hmm. And I got like some editorial assistant on the phone. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, I used to be involved in gangs in London and I write about it now. Mm -hmm. like, I think he'd be interested yeah. in it. Yeah. And like, I just literally said that and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, we'd love, like, could you send something over to us? Like, that sounds right up our street kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I sent them a short story and they were like, bang, we want to publish it. Mm -hmm. But it's also challenging in the sense that I was trying to write literature and they, and they totally got that the style of what I was writing was very literary, mm -hmm. not journalistic, mm -hmm. which is actually much more what Vice does yeah. is journalistic stuff. And it was really when I hooked up with Joel Golby who was an amazing editor and also totally understood what I was trying to do in terms mm -hmm. of writing this kind of gritty realism but with mm -hmm. a literary aspect mm -hmm. to it and a literary quality to it. And he basically helped me through that process. You, you need people to help you in, in all, all these processes of trying to be a writer. You, you need to meet people and when you meet a good person who gets what you're doing, mm -hmm. you need to you need to be faithful to those people mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and and understand what they're trying to do for you as well. So if somebody wants to edit your work to put mm -hmm. it into a magazine, you can't be protective of it mm -hmm. and defensive and think no one must change any aspect of my work because mm -hmm. you're not going to get anywhere with that. Mm -hmm. Because editors are also there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they know what they're doing exactly. and, and they're doing it because they want to get your work out there, not because they're trying to, you know, sabotage you and, mm -hmm. and yeah. First of all, I'd answer that question by quoting James Baldwin, mm -hmm. who said that identity is the garment with which one clothes the nakedness of the self. Mm -hmm. So I think identity is something that's malleable and that's changeable and that's not fixed. I think the way in which others project identity onto people is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And it's something that people almost, one could almost say people suffer from that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of myself, one of the worst things that's happened since the book coming out is certain mainstream newspapers labeling me a gangster. I'm yeah. not a gangster, I never was a gangster, mm -hmm. I've never claimed or purported to be a gangster, mm -hmm. but they have decided to put that label on me. And once they've decided to put that label on me, a lot of readers now frame me in that way. And it's an incredibly narrowing thing for mm -hmm. other people to do that to you. Mm -hmm. I think my sense of identity was certainly shaped by my experiences because my identity, I have, for example, a twin brother. We grew up in the same household with the same family. Mm -hmm. We have completely different <laughs> identities. Mm -hmm. And that's partly to do with how our experiences have shaped us. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how, you know, ex how externalized perceptions are projected onto a person and then that becomes part of a person's identity. Yeah, I mean, I reject those projections from, mm -hmm. From society or from the media or whatever I reject them but unfortunately I'm also a victim of the fact that I can't control that narrative yeah. and I can't control how others perceive me mm -hmm. I think as well in terms of how that shapes one's identity it's an important thing to remember that you know the personal aspect of your identity is is what you need to hold on to mm -hmm. and and you need to kind of stand by that and not allow others to shape your identity mm -hmm. but there are you know yeah, the way in which other people's perceptions shape you, they, they can have an impact on you. I mean, I think one of the most important things about identity is what Baldwin said, you know, identity is the garment with, with which one clothes the nakedness of the self. And his point that he's making is not that, that it's just something with which, in which one hides the self. No, it's to do with the fact that while the self is the one constant thing, mm -hmm. your identity can change, you can change your identity, but you should never allow others to change your identity, even when they want to, even when they want to. All you have to do is believe in yourself and your own identity. Mm. So there's a, yeah, there's a, there's definitely a difficulty in terms of writing auto fiction, anything like that, anything when you're going to tread on the truth and like expose the truth mm. is you're going to take certain risks. Mm. And I mean, I don't have any regrets. Mm -hmm. I don't have any regrets about what I wrote because it was important to tell the story and it was important to open the window to that world, mm -hmm. the a world which is basically marginalized. And 
the thing is, it's like the world of gang culture and people living in, in environments that are heavily affected by crime, violence and, and gangs and, mm. and who live in a climate of violence, they're marginalised also, not just in terms of the fact that their stories are not told, but they're also marginalised in the sense that when they are, when, when those worlds are kind of recounted, there's really two main ways in which they're recounted. They're either clinically recounted by journalists who mm -hmm. don't understand a lot of things, who get a lot of things wrong mm -hmm. in the process mm -hmm. of trying to write about them, mm -hmm. or who pigeonhole people's experiences, or you, or it's just limited to like a few lines in a newspaper article about mm -hmm. a stabbing, for example. Mm -hmm. And you don't know about the complexity of all those people's lives and what moments led up to that. And you don't mm -hmm. know about, for example, that the person who committed the stabbing, who's who's just been portrayed in just this this you know, very narrow, one-dimensional way of this is a criminal, he's done something wrong and the police are hunting for him. What about his dreams and hopes and aspirations? And that's not to take anything away from mm. the victim, mm. but it's very easy to empathise with a victim. Mm -hmm. But to empathise with a perpetrator is incredibly difficult, mm -hmm. which I understand. But those people do have some value in terms of people understanding the complexities of yeah. their story, their lives and their experiences. Mm -hmm. There's also the other way in which these worlds are portrayed is often in a very glamorous way, entertainment, mm -hmm. like a film about gangsters. Mm -hmm. Everyone goes away from it being like, I want to be a gangster. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the mandem have posters of Scarface in their bedroom. That's mm -hmm. all they did at some mm -hmm. point in it. And it's mm -hmm. like, did you not like, did you not watch it to the end? Because it, it, it goes wrong, <laughs> yeah. but everyone's kind of like at, aspiring to that in it. And it's yeah. like, it's almost like, you know, as long as I don't kill my best friend and dip my face into a huge plate of cocaine, mm -hmm. I'll get it right. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, you won't get it mm -hmm. right. And sometimes the message of those films gets lost because of how glamorous the portrayal is on screen. And one of the things I wanted to portray with my book in, in itself and in terms of writing about the truth is how unglamorous it is, mm -hmm. how depressing it is, mm -hmm. how draining, mentally and emotionally draining it is. Mm -hmm. and how how traumatic it is because there's also that aspect where as as young men in that environment no one would ever admit to being traumatized or carrying trauma with them because that's an admission of some form of weakness or yeah. it's perceived as the admission of, of, of an admission of weakness mm. and now I personally I find it very difficult sometimes when when I see somebody saying that you know they I don't know for I'm, I'm now giving a kind of pithy example that's maybe more symbolic than real but like if somebody got shouted at by somebody in the street and they're like I feel traumatized mm. I've, that, that affects me greatly because it's like I've seen people and the first time I saw somebody get stabbed I was mm. 13 years old mm -hmm. I didn't think of it at the time as a traumatic experience mm. but when I think about all the experiences and all the things that I've seen when now nowadays it's like people throw around the word trauma without mm -hmm. really understanding the depth of the, of what that word means and what it represents yeah. and what it represents for a lot of people mm -hmm. and also there's an unhealthy attitude as well among other people who are like oh we'll get over it because that happened then and this is mm -hmm. now which is a completely unproductive and unempathetic attitude and approach to other people's traumas so it's a very yeah. I mean, the the whole process of writing auto fiction as well, in that sense as well, is can be traumatic. It can be equally cathartic and traumatic when you're putting part of your life onto the page. Mm. And my my biggest advice to anybody who wants to write auto fiction or wants to write about their own lives is be brave. Mm. Just be brave and and don't don't feel at any don't let anybody make you feel that you can't write what you want to write. Mm. And even if you're going to face backlash and challenges along the way. As long as this is what your heart is telling you to do, it will be worth it. In the long run, it will be worth it. Mm -hmm. I think I want readers to understand that what they're reading is the reality of this world. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much about empathy. I mean, it would be nice to be empathised with, of course. <laughs> but also the other thing is that I don't want to take anything away from, you know, um, a victim's trauma, right? Yeah. And it's very important in that discussion that even if I'm identifying my own trauma or the trauma of people who've had these experiences or for example the character in the book he experiences trauma mm -hmm. but that doesn't take away from the trauma of the victims which mm -hmm. is ultimately worse because they're just minding their own business mm -hmm. in a lot of situations and then suddenly they're the victims of an incredibly violent crime mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. but the point is is that there's an unhealthy attitude of dehumanizing that you know the perpetrator is, is inhuman and the victim is human mm -hmm. and that's it this mm -hmm. this very binary approach mm -hmm. to it and that's it and it's mm -hmm. it's limited to that one of the things i would relate it to is that nietzsche said morality is relative to the level of danger in which people live i mean he didn't say it exactly like mm -hmm. that but this is my my understanding of some of the things he writes about morality is morality is relative to the level of danger in which you live mm -hmm. if you live in a dangerous 
context and a dangerous world, you don't have the same moral code and you don't live according to the same moral code. And one of the things that I, will, I kind of want people to understand in reading this book is when there's this debate about oh why are young people involved in gangs and why are all the why are there all these knife crime problems and everything mm -hmm. and, and you know somebody comes on the on the news and says this has to stop and then their posters put up on bus stops which say bin knives save lives and mm -hmm. all these kind of things it's mm -hmm. like none of that is going to work mm -hmm. because if you're committed to living that lifestyle and you're in that lifestyle mm -hmm. You're already your your threshold of empathy, your moral code is completely different and alien to mm -hmm. to the people who are you know trying to make a change basically. Mm -hmm. To understand the root problem of young men involved in violent crime mm -hmm. and everything, you also you can't just be like oh it's because the youth clubs are closed down and mm -hmm. because also there's another aspect to it. It's incredibly patronising to people who grow up in big like with massive disadvantages and in extreme poverty and then make great things of themselves mm -hmm. and have great successes and do incredibly positive things mm -hmm. it's incredibly patronizing mm -hmm. to people like that to be like oh it's because of poverty and mm -hmm. you know it's because of like buildings with broken lifts and not enough youth clubs because then it's like well what about the countless other people who grow up in those disadvantaged mm -hmm. experiences and situations who make great things of themselves mm -hmm. like it takes away something from them so there needs to be a more kind of incisive discussion i think about the psychology mm -hmm. of people the psychology of young men who are drawn mm -hmm. to this lifestyle the psychology of young women who are attracted by that lifestyle mm -hmm. as well so and i think that's that's kind of part of the very important thing about my book which i want people to to understand mm -hmm. my book ultimately in terms of people empathizing with the character is you know some people will empathize and some people won't mm -hmm. and some people will find it you know reprehensible although there are also layers of humanity within mm -hmm. there that people should be able to see and they should be able to see through the violence to the humanity beneath yeah. it but my book is a confrontation mm. it's a confrontation with the reader and it's a confrontation with the world and it's confronting people about their own sense of morality mm -hmm. and their perspectives mm -hmm. so it's not supposed to be easy it's mm -hmm. not supposed to be a, a a book that leaves you with a warm fuzzy feeling inside you know it's supposed to be a book that 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 kind of and also it's a book that's i'm um, you know trying not to let the reader breathe you know i've mm. I grabbed them drag them into the room and it's like sit down and listen because yeah. this is the reality this is what it's really like and this is what it's really about not all the stuff that you read in the news or what you see on tv or what. the release of my book felt almost anticlimactic <laughs> because i'd anticipated it for so long and mm -hmm. i'd thought about it for so long and there's also a certain moment as a writer i think where if you if you genuinely envision your life being spent as a writer and mm -hmm. you're you want to have that kind of trajectory once you've let go of the first book that you've written mm -hmm. or whichever one in the process that you're you're writing and you've and you've done it mm -hmm. and then you're just waiting for you know the pr to start rolling and the marketing mm -hmm. department to do what they do you're already thinking about the next book mm -hmm. that you want to write and by and large, and I would say if you're a good writer and, and you want to aspire to be a, a better writer, you will always be self-critical. Mm -hmm. And I think any artist who aspires mm -hmm. to, to create great art and great work will always be self-critical and you need that self-criticism. It's not a self-criticism that comes out of a, a need for others to reassure you that what you've done is brilliant or wonderful mm -hmm. or beautiful or whatever. It's the fact that you need to constantly aim for something higher than what you've already done. Mm -hmm. So there was an anticlimactic element to it in the sense that if I were to try and read my book, which I never will, if I were to try and read my book, I would only spot all the flaws with it mm -hmm. and the problems with it. In fact, there's only one line in the entire book that I really feel like, yeah, I nailed it there. Mm -hmm. And everything else. The line is when I describe like people on my block where mm -hmm. I used to live and, I, and the line is, um, man them on the block with diamonds, sh sh man them shot and crack on the block with diamond grills shining in black faces like fallen gods chewing stars. Mm -hmm. And that line is because it's about beauty because a lot of people see those environments as like, oh, it's all, you know, rain beaten concrete and mm -hmm. like, like gang members on balconies, like with hoods over their heads and that. I see beauty in that as well, mm -hmm. innit? Like, you know, all those fallen gods chewing stars, innit? Mm -hmm. With like the profiles of, you know, sculptures of pharaohs from mm. ancient Egypt that's how I see it not as some kind of like evil sinister like mm. environment mm. even though there's a lot of a sinister kind of threatening kind of feeling lurking in, in, mm. in those kind of environments but yeah so I think in terms of in terms of the book release it was like there was an anticlimactic element of it also an impatience for me that I want to get on to the next one mm.
I could this judge from the book of price said the story is about you know this young guy who lives on a rather dodgy estate and it's like rather dodgy estate what when men are getting head topped in broad daylight and getting their lives taken that's that's rather dodgy to you it's like as soon as i heard that i was like you don't get this book yeah. like and also the fact that it's like humorous that I'm going to university and reading Nietzsche and then mm. committing crime at night or whatever. And it's like, no, it's not humorous. Mm. It's like, it's a reflection of the moral complexity of people. And there is humor within the book, yeah. unintentional humor. There are definitely moments of humor. But I just felt that analysis was very reductive. Mm. And that's, that's one of the problems with like, you know, I, I'm much more, I feel much more close to readers who've read my book and who've, who've responded positively than I do to critics because critics will always to some extent be blighted by their own personal angle of how they decide to interpret something mm -hmm. and how something feels to them whereas to me like a reader because a reader will also be critical of me and I mean I remember someone wrote something about my book which they started by saying they're the kind of person who when they see violence and sex in films they fast forward it and it's like well then don't read the book and then they went on to write this big criticism of my book and it's like yeah well obviously mm -hmm. but at least that's that's from a personal perspective and that's from a that's a visceral reaction to mm -hmm. it you know so yeah I want it to be read forever mm -hmm. I want it to last forever mm -hmm. if someone were to come to me and say you can make a million pounds off this book or you can have a million people reading your book but you won't make any money mm -hmm. without question mm -hmm. i want a million people to read the book and not make money from mm -hmm. it i want it to impact people's lives i want it mm -hmm. to change the way in which people look at the world around them mm -hmm. and i want people to see beyond just the fact that it's london and knife crime and gang crime and as well i want it just to be a story i want it to be perceived and understood as a story about young people living in climates of violence, which is a universal experience, mm -hmm. especially in, in big cities in the Western world. Mm -hmm. And I want people to kind of see the, the kind of complexity that, that young people and people growing up face in terms of moral challenges and the pressures of different environments and how they affect people. Mm -hmm. I think the legacy I want, you know, I, I want my book to be read when I'm dead. Mm -hmm. Next, the next thing that I'm working on now is I'm working on a book that's about a, um, transgenerational trauma or epigenetics and it's basically examining in the ways in which people's lives are shaped by the trauma that their ancestors or their mm -hmm. previous generations before them experienced and how that impacts their lives and their psyches. Mm -hmm. um, I'm particularly fascinated by it in terms of some of my own personal family history coming from Poland and the way in which the country was devastated during the Second World War mm -hmm. and how my parents were born into this kind of destroyed world mm -hmm. and how it affected them and then how I think part of that was passed on to me. Mm -hmm. I also read a lot of really interesting stuff about basically the children of uh, Holocaust survivors mm -hmm. and also the descendants of people of um, who'd basically been victims of the Atlantic slave trade and how that affected their psyches and you basically relive an unknown trauma by seeing some of these things and reading about your own history. It can be a very kind of traumatic experience so yes I'm writing about that I'm also working on a film script based on an amazing and largely completely unknown holocaust novel mm. which I think is only read on a on a small university course in Yale a module in Yale and generally it's like not in print mm -hmm. um, so yes yeah, so I'm working on a film script for that and yeah I mean I want to I, all I want to do is continue writing mm. and that's what my life is now is trying to be a writer and as long as there's you know bread on the table then it's like I will write mm. that's what I'll do and I'd like to also I'd like to be a I'd like to teach creative writing yo Queen Mary shout me <laughs> uh, <laughs> holler at me <laughs>
on Twitter, people were saying, you know, the literary agents at one point were like, we need to hear more voices. And it's like, mm. what now you need to hear more voices? What now? What about before? What were you lot doing before? Because mm. there's, there's a lot of stuff as well in publishing that's mad tokenistic. And mm. it's like, that's actually not good for people who do need to be heard because exactly. because it's just symbolic, basically. Mm. And it's just, it's, um, it's performative as well. Like, I remember when the Black Lives Matter protests were happening and people were people some people were like posting these mad piffy like symbolic weird things I remember some white people posting shit like mm. oh, I'm educating myself now mm. and I'm like what were you doing before yeah. like what were you doing before then so you're basically like a huge part of this mm. problem because oh now you're educating mm. yourself well, mm. well what have you been doing for the last mm. 20 years of your life mm. like and I posted this um, extract from Ms. Cesar, you know, I don't, I don't know. So he's this amazing Martinique. Gave him away um, that book. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's from translated by the legendary yeah. John Berger, yeah. who I, I studied. So yeah. I studied, yeah. So I studied John Berger in, mm. in QM, yeah. But listen to this madness, yeah. One day, my mum, my mum was like looking after this old lady in in some big grand house somewhere in central London, and she comes back from this this house one day, and she's like, oh, I just met this this man called John Berger, do you know him? I'm like, you met John Berger? I'm like, <laughs> oh what God. the fuck? I'm like, can I write him a note? Yeah. Like, will you see him again? She was like, yeah. So I wrote him a note just saying mm. how like he'd had a huge impact on me and other Queen Mary students. And I have a book with from John Berger and like with an inscription mm. to me, to Gabriel, and he'd, draw, he'd drawn a flower in it. Oh. And I was just like, oh my day. <laughs> and then I think like literally three weeks after that, he died. Oh my God. Yeah. There's this amazing passage in Emma Cesaire's book, Return to My Native Land. Mm -hmm. So Emma Cesaire was basically a Martinican poet, mm -hmm. and he was the founder of this movement called Negritude, mm -hmm. which is this movement basically of French or Francophone writers mm -hmm. who are either from the Caribbean or colonies, ex-colonies, mm -hmm. ex-French colonies. Really, but I think Franz Fanon was actually part of it as mm -hmm. well at one point, although it was a little bit more of a literary movement mm -hmm. as opposed to a kind of political movement. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this amazing poem, and in this poem, there's this amazing passage. I can't remember it from from memory, but mm. it's something about the line is the opening line is beware of being a spectator, mm -hmm. beware of assuming the sterile attitude of a of a spectator who folds his arms. And it says because life is not a proscenium, and a man who a man who cries out is not a dancing bear. And I posted that. Mm. at that time because I felt it was specifically very powerful beware of being a spectator mm. don't just spectate you mm. have to do something mm. Mm. and no one engages with it mm. why because no one's no one wants to read mm. an a extract of mm. a very beautiful lyrical but also you know conceptually complex poem mm. but they want to write like you know some pithy little statement and like and get and do it for the likes as well there's this mm. culture of doing it for mm. the likes and it's like yeah I mean things are massively dumbed down I think but